Thank you all for coming. I think most of you guys know me. I'm Eugene May, the neuro-ophthalmologist, and uh, I'm happy to be introducing our grand round speaker this morning. I was on a medical advisory committee for the National MS Society who was interested in addressing the issue of gadolinium safety because, as we all know, people with multiple sclerosis get lots of MRI scans and lots of gadolinium, and the MS Society took it upon itself to try to address that issue and guide its uh, patients and providers, and as a part of that, uh, we had Manny uh, make a presentation to the Medical Advisory Committee, and I felt that the information that we got was so important and so compelling and would be really useful for neurologists, uh, and so fortunately, he's agreed to come out here and talk to us today about gadolinium. He is a neuroradiologist. He did his radiology training, fellowship in MRI, fellowship in neuroradiology in Pittsburgh, he is currently the director of MR services in the Department of Radiology for the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center system. And uh, he has been deeply involved in this gadolinium safety issue. He's a consultant to the FDA on MR safety, and he's chaired and served on several committees and boards regarding MR and gadolinium safety and has spoken widely about the topic. So uh, thank you for coming. We'll have time at the end of the talk for questions, and here's Dr. Emmanuel Canal. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Good morning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's see if you'll do that at the end. A um, few things. First of all, I, I'm actually from the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. As you heard, I do not represent the university. Um, with this presentation, everything is under my own recognizance, so to speak. So um, this is an area in which radiologists are very aware is um, frighteningly politically charged, which is another way of saying there are massive amounts of investments of funds that are directed and redirected based on the information that people believe they understand about this topic. And so I have found, I started out in surgery, then I went to medicine, then I went into radiology. And I have found that um, science is not winning in this one. This, is, um, this whole discussion is politically charged. It's financially motivated dramatically um, and is um, it's quite controversial. So what I really hope to do by the time we're done here, and I don't mean this as a joke, um, I hope to impress upon you by the end of the next 45 minutes to an hour how little I know about this. And I'm not saying that as a joke. I actually am trying to be serious with you. I have spent an awful lot of time trying to understand this and trying to differentiate opinion from, I can't use the word fact. I'm going to say I like to differentiate opinion from peer-reviewed literature. I try not to confuse peer-reviewed literature with fact, but it's at least the best that we seem to have till now. And I hope to impress upon you how little society, not just Manny, how little society actually knows compared to the dogmatic statements and extremely strong rulings, not just opinions, that you'll be hearing about this topic that will affect you and how you care for your patients and affect the options that I have access to as well, both in the United States and abroad. I also put a date. When do you lecture and put a date on your title? Um, this is changing daily. So approximately seven, eight months ago, I started putting dates on the title, especially because you're recording it, so that you'll know as of when. That's, that, it is that important because it will change by a week from now. I was contacted nine, 10 hours ago by the FDA again about another issue. This is constantly changing, and we'll, we'll get to that as part of the presentation. These are my, especially after that introduction, um, everyone, as far as I'm concerned, is potentially on the take, and that certainly includes me. Um, everyone seems to have an agenda in these discussions, and I will try to be extremely careful about differentiating my opinion from peer-reviewed literature being the basis of for what I'm presenting to you, whether it's accurate or not. My um, active consultation that I have to reveal to you is Bracco Diagnostics and Gerbet. These are two companies that make and actively sell contrast agents. However, whether I have to reveal it or not, I also have recently, although not in the last 12 months, I have also consulted with every pharmaceutical firm in the world that makes MR contrast agents. Before we get started, I just need to put us all on the same footing. Nephrogenic systemic fibrosis, or NSF, which nobody wants to hear about anymore, but there's this disease. It's very, very rare. It's associated with people that have poor renal function who receive 
gadolinium-based contrast agents, what, why does it happen? As best as we know, the reason that people get NSF is theory. We don't have an answer. There have been no cases of NSF that are new in the peer review literature since 2008, 2009. In the legal areas, there have been one or two cases, but they're all essentially negligent. They should not have been administered, the drug that they were given, et cetera, but only one or two cases since 2009. Having said that, we don't have enough data to tell you what causes it. So it's all theory, and that's an integral part of what we're going to discuss this morning. The theory is a theory of transmetallation, also known as dissociation, also known as of um, dechelation. Gadolinium, they teach us, is a toxin. It's amazing how little we know about its toxicity in humans. Seems to predominantly be a neurotoxin or predominantly a toxin that is competing with calcium, even though it's a plus three and calcium is a plus two, but from a size-wise, it's an almost perfect match for calcium plus two, and the toxicity seems to be predominantly related to substituting for calcium in many of the reactions in humans. In any case, we therefore don't give gadolinium to humans because they tell us it would be toxic to do so. So instead of taking the, the ion gadolinium, the atom, the element gadolinium and injecting it, it's a heavy metal, it's a lanthanide, we stick it onto a ligand molecule. It ties it up, it's a chaperone molecule. In fact, the different brands of agents that are out there differ from each other in the ligand molecule and predominantly 99 plus percent, that's their difference between them. And so you may hear brand names like Omniscan, Magnavist, Optimark, Multihance, Prohance. These names, Gadavist, Doterim, those are all the seven used for neuro. These names differentiate each other essentially by what is the other molecule attached to the gadolinium. So if I'm the gadolinium ion, then who you match me to, who am I coupled with before you inject the two of us into this human is what determines our name. If your name is caldiamide, then gadolinium and caldiamide, we call that together gadodiamide or a brand name Omniscan. If your name is pentacetic acid and you put you and me together, and then inject us into the patient. We call it Magnavist, gadopentatate. Got it? So it's really, it's not me. Don't look at me, look at her. She is the reason that differentiates drug A from B and drug C. In the theory of transmetallation, how well she does her job is a massive part of what differentiates the agents out there. And you will hear them describing the agents by their characteristics, and they will call some of them linear agents. What's a linear agent? A linear agent is you stick your hand out and I stick my hand out and we hold hands and we're injected into the patient. Three-dimensionally, technically, I sort of have you wrap around my legs and then bond. But the molecule still, as it is, it's a single linear bond. And it means just what you think it means. It's linear. It's physically deformable. And if something, anything, were to attract you away from me at a greater force, it's just physical, it's PCAM. If something attracts her away at a greater force than I attract you to me, she's out of here. And that leaves us relatively easy to deform. Compared to a linear bond, uh, the linear agents out there, brand names, I'm supposed to use chemical names, I believe that's a farce. If you talk to your radiologist, if you talk to the technologist and you say, inject gadoversetamide into this patient, they will look at you like you're from Mars. They'll have no clue what you're talking about. So I try not to keep up false pretenses and I choose not to talk with you about chemical names. I'll use the same language we use in the hospital. The brand names of the linear agents in alphabetical order so I don't get sued the brand names of the linear agents that you should be familiar with are um, Magnavist, Multihance, Optimark. I missed one. Ma Magnavist, um, Multihance, Optimark, and I have to think about what the fourth one is. There are four linear agents. These are the ones used for neuro. There are two other agents used for non-neuro. One is called, in Europe, Vasovist in the United States, Ablovar. They recently took Ablovar off the market. It works fine, it's just financially it was a failure. The other is Eovist in the United States, known as Primovist in Europe. Eovist is used for hepatic imaging, also based on gadolinium. So there are seven total drugs used for neuro. Four of them are linear agents. The other three, Gadavist, Adoterim, Gadavist, and Prohance, the other three agents are macrocyclic. What's macrocyclic? Macrocyclic means instead of grabbing my hand, there are four of you. 
And there are four simultaneous bonds around, actually above and around, the gadolinium molecule tied to it. In order for us, four is stability, like, a, like the legs of the table or a chair. So number one, it's a rigid bond. Number two, it's not deformable. Number two, it, in order for that bond to break and for me to escape, all four bonds have to simultaneously break. And I don't know any of this stuff. In fact, I hate chemistry. The chemists teach us that that's almost, in a sense, it's a mathematical impossibility, essentially speaking. It's not going to happen. So with this in mind, the theory of transmetallation is that while the two of us are injected into this patient, the two of us are circulating in the extracellular space. Water molecules get close to us. She means nothing when it comes to the water molecule. I cause the water molecule's magnetization pattern to change, and we can detect that on an MRI image. And then we take the image, and then the two of us are urinated out. All seven neuroagents are excreted only by glomerular filtration. There is one exception. Multihance has a 4 to 7 percent excretion vicariously through the, um, the liver biliary system, but it's a very small amount. Even that one, if your, liver, if your kidneys are shut down, essentially the stuff is not leaving your body. Patients with poor kidneys, half-life sticks around for a long time. And therefore, since it sticks around for longer, oh, sorry, the normal half-life of these agents, all of them, all seven, the normal half-life is approximately 90 to 120 minutes, biologic half-life. Now, having said that, if the half-life increases, that would, mean, that would mean that I'm going to stick around for a lot longer. And like any bond, it is temporally defined. And the theory suggests that if we stick around for too long, it's just a matter of time until suddenly somebody taps her on the shoulder and says, excuse me, may I have this dance? She takes one look at him, she takes one look at me, and shoom, she's out of here, leaving me all alone on the dance floor, which the theory suggests is not a good idea. Don't feel sorry for me. I've had my eyes on that phosphate for a while. And that's actually the key. Right now, the, my competitor for my attention would be predominantly things like phosphate, citrate, and carbonate. But right now, people are really blaming phosphate. Now, the reason I'm saying this to you, and who cares? I told you I hate chemistry. This is so cool. When they stick this young lady on me, it's not just that she chaperones me and decreases my toxicity by blocking some of my interactive sites. Do you know what else she is? With all due respect, she's a postage stamp. Do you understand? She determines biodistribution. What you stick me onto determines where in the body we are welcome. That, I, I guess, makes sense, I hope, to everybody. So if you stick me onto a caldiamide, onto a pentacetate, what ends up happening is that address is the extracellular fluid. And I can now biodistribute throughout the extracellular fluid of this human. But if I leave, either because she kicks me out, or I wander, and I find myself a phosphate, where do phosphates live in the human body? They live in bone. And that's going to be critical, because people today think that bone serves as a reservoir. And I'll show you some of that data. So my address, where I get FedEx to, my bio distribution is going to change should she make the mistake of letting go. And so the theory of transmetallation, dechelation, dissociation, the theory is that somehow, because the bad kidneys, I stick around for so we stick around for so long, it's just statistics, it's just math. Eventually, a competitor succeeds in either getting my attention or hers, breaking our bond, and that somehow cascades into my associating with someone else, biodistributing differently, causing inflammatory reactions, and eventually leading to nephrogenic systemic fibrosis. That's the theory. And therefore, linears are horrendous agents, and they should all be taken out and shot. The macrocyclics are the good guys, and they're safe. Now, I'm putting it that way because that's what the world is going to tell you. There are phenomenally powerful pressures today that every radiologist is seeing. It's almost 100%. You really don't understand how different this presentation is. Approximately 100% of the articles that have ever been published will use the word macrocyclics, plural, will use the word linears, plural, as if all the macrocyclics are the same, as if all the linears are the same. But unfortunately, the, the only problem with that is that 
the data doesn't support it. And by data, I mean only that which is in the peer-reviewed literature. The finances support it. There are hundreds of millions of dollars that support it. It's just that if you want to call the peer-reviewed literature reality, peer-reviewed literature doesn't seem to work with the theory as well as we would like, and I'll show you how. So if you look at long-term safety issues for gadolinium, there are two topics. I am misleading you on purpose because, with tremendous respect, Dean didn't allow me to have you all day. He said, you got it for a few dozen minutes. And so the other topics I won't talk with you about. I just have a question for you. Do you, you guys know who Chuck Norris is? Every Y chromosome is saying yes. Every female is saying, what are you talking about? Anyway, guys, you know who Chuck Norris is, right? Have you heard of what he's doing in this topic? Raise your hand if you've heard about what he's doing. Chuck Norris's wife. Um, national televised news, a, t a 20 minute special. Hold on, I gotta get this thing out so you can hear it. I think you'll be able to hear it. I have been poisoned with gadolinium or by gadolinium and we don't have much time to figure out how to get this out of my body or I'm going to die. Treatment revealed that the gadolinium, which was supposed to be gone from her body hours after each MRI, had remained in astonishing levels that were literally off the charts. This is in the danger zone, and you will see that I stayed at that level for a very, very long time. One that takes gadolinium is not going to get sick. It's the ones that are sensitive, like Gina. You know me. I didn't. You know I've taken them and I've never gotten sick. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't do something about the other people that are getting sick from the gadolinium. Over 30 million people have seen this, and that doesn't count the downloads. So. I'm only going to spend time on what I believe are the major issues. The major issues and what's going to attract your attention are going to be added to, whether we like it or not, by the perception of your patients. GadoliniumToxicity.com, also known as the Lighthouse Project, there are a group of patients who have reached Congress and FDA's attention, to put it mildly, saying, you are killing American citizens, what are you? And in the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, with tremendous respect, we dwarf Swedish. We have 65,000 employees. We have 19 plus hospitals. When I get back, they'll probably have acquired two or three more. We have had reports from every hospital coming to me as the MR medical director that patients all across our system, across multiple states, are saying, what are you putting in my arm? I don't want that. So you need to be careful and need to be aware. The patients are going to start hearing hype, some real maybe, maybe not, but there's an awful lot out there. And people like Chuck Norris have an awful lot more sway than physicians when it comes to the attention of Congress. And so that's really going to be on, on their ear. We are going to talk about specifically these two areas, nephrogenic systemic fibrosis I'll spend two seconds on, and the rest of what we have left this morning on retained or residual gadolinium. NSF, it says it happens from contrast agents. There's a term called confounded or unconfounded. The FDA came up with this term. I actually like it. If you get gadolinium drug A, and four weeks later they do a biopsy and they say you have NSF, that's called unconfounded. You got drug A, a few weeks later you got a diagnosis, there's some kind of association. If you get drug B and drug C, and then two months later drug D, and then five weeks later you get biopsied with NSF, is it because of B or C or D or, or both or combination? We don't know. So they call that confounded. So if you look only at the unconfounded data worldwide, There are only a few hundred cases of NSF worldwide. There are several hundred million doses that have been administered. Of the few hundred cases, Omniscan, linear agent, has the, by far the most, several hundred cases. There are approximately 95 to 100 cases with Magnavist. There are 35 cases associated with Optimark. There are three cases associated with Gadavist. The top three are linear agents. 
So, so far, this seems to be working. Gadavis was a macrocyclic. There are three cases in their product literature in their package insert. Prohans is a macrocyclic agent. It's not in their literature, but there is one possible case in Switzerland. A guy got double dose six times over two years. They claim that there is NSF. I don't think there's biopsy, but just in case, I'm going to put it in there as a possible one. That's it, worldwide, ever, since the beginning of time. So having said that, you will hear people say, if it would not be for the linear agents, there would be no NSF. Be careful, the next thing I'm about to say is opinion. It is my opinion that that's a true statement. It's my opinion that that's an accurate statement. Having said that, the linear agents, Omniscan, Magnavist, Multihance, Optimark. Multihance isn't on that list. In fact, the agents for which nephrogenic systemic fibrosis has never been reported following their prior unconfounded administration, Dotorem, that's a macrocyclic, Ablavar, Eovist, and Multihance. Now, Ablavar, there have only been a couple million doses in the world, so let's forget that one. Eovist, probably no more than five, eight million in the world. Multihance, more than 30 million. Zero cases. In fact, its molecular structure is so exquisitely close to Magnavis. Magnavis has approximately 100 cases, unconfounded. So wait, they're both linear agents. Yeah, that's right. They both have at least 30, 35 million doses administered. Yeah, that's right. And one has 100 cases and one has zero as of last Thursday. Yeah, that's right. So why are we lumping the linears together like they're all identical, something seems to be different here. I should point out the, um, the bottom three agents you see here, all three of those linears, those are the only linear agents, those are the only agents that bind proteins. So is it that taking a molecule and putting it next to a massive albumin or melanin or some other protein that's hundreds and hundreds of thousands molecular weight, does that block potential interactions that might cause a dissociation? We don't know, it's just theory. It sounds great, but we, we just don't know the answer to that question. And is that more protective? Who knows? All we can do is tell you what data we have. There are zero cases for those three linears. All three of those just happen by coincidence to be the only ones that bind to proteins. Every other linear agent has multiple cases of NSF. Residual and retained gadolinium. So now it's been, since 2011, Dr. Kanda first presented in the Japanese Radiological Society that they find that there's changes in the magnetization behavior of brains, certain parts of the brain, the globus pallidus and dentate predominantly. They change their, they look different if you gave them a whole bunch of contrast in the past. And pretty rapidly, they found that um, this was the case for some agents, but not all of them. And to super, super summarize about 50 slides into two slides, my best way to try to summarize is that T1 shortening or changing the magnetization behavior, it looks, like it's, it looks like it's enhancing, but you didn't inject anything yet. For patients that have had four, five, six or more injections in the past of either Omniscan or Magnavis, that's incontroversial. There's no controversy about this. That's clear. They have T1 shortening. There's never been a single article that refuted that. Prohans, a macrocyclic. There's never been a single article that shows in humans T1 shortening after getting multi hands. Uh, Prohans, I don't care how many doses they got, 15, 20, 30. No one's ever shown T1 shortening in a human from Prohans. So these are the incontroversial three, but out of the seven, that leaves four, doesn't it? Optimark is one of the four. The company, uh, Three days ago, on July 10th, um, Gerbet announced that they are killing off Optimark. And in the United States, within a few months, and in Europe, within a few months, in the US, and the rest of the world, within two years. So Optimark's out of the picture. That leaves us with six. Three were non-controversial, but that leaves a couple here that we have to focus on. Dotorem and Gadavist, two macrocyclic agents. So there have been multiple manuscripts now that have shown that you can either see changes on the image, T1 shortening, or measure changes on the image, or on animals, or even on some human biopsies, measure the presence of gadolinium. After multiple administrations of these macrocyclic agents, Dotorem and Gadavist. Dotorem wasn't on that list three and a half weeks ago. 
It's recent publications. But I don't understand, but they're macrocyclic. No, you're right. And there are multiple peer-reviewed literature articles that have failed to show T1 shortening or changes in the brain after those same two drugs were administered in the same publications, in the same journals. So here, the data is quite controversial and conflicting. Those are the macrocyclics for which there is controversial data. How about linears? Multihance, a linear agent, the first publication about it says no T1 shortening is seen. Then along came one, two, or three that said, yeah, it is. What's the matter with you? And they showed clear T1 shortening with that agent. And then multiple others came out. The last three to four weeks, multiple others came out. And now the majority of articles say, I don't know what you're talking about. There's no T1 shortening. And we looked at kids and adults and nothing. Once again, in our peer-reviewed literature, directly contradictory data about this drug as well, a linear agent. So now let's super summarize. If you look at animal data, if you look at images, and much more importantly, if you look at the actual biopsies or autopsies, whether of animals or humans, measure, measure what's going on. Every single agent leaves gadolinium in the brain. Every single agent, macrocyclic, linear, ionic, non-ionic, every single agent leaves gadolinium. Very small amounts, but it's clearly present and cumulative. Now that we know that, are they all the same? The macrocyclics, as you will be reading and hearing, leave less. The linears leave more. Dr. Murata published this from, he's actually from um, this neck of the woods. Dr. Murata published this data which I found fascinating. The first thing he wanted people to recognize, which we've actually known about from an article in um, Gibby in 2004, repeated and confirmed in 2006 by White, is that we actually, you think we're leaving stuff in the brain. We leave, listen carefully, orders of magnitude more in the bone and in other organs. But Murata was focusing on bone as well. So he's trying to show that the brain is there for sure, but whatever happens in the brain is happening in the bone much, much more so, and they scale together. Furthermore, looking at his data, he looked at all patients he could get his hands on and said, number one, I need patients that have had multiple administrations of these drugs. Number two, you have to agree to die. And number three, you have to agree after you keel over to allow me to have access to your brain to study it. So you can imagine how difficult it was to get people recruited for that one. He found nine people. I'm sometimes embarrassed talking to non-radiologists when, when you hear some of the things that we're making, the decisions that we're making, and the statements that we're making, and what it's based on. If you take the world's literature to date, ever, ever published anywhere in the world, the number of human autopsies or biopsies of gadolinium that was residual in the brain, total, it's a few dozen, three or so dozen total patients worldwide ever. And yet we're making massive, massive statements as if we know what we're talking about based on that. So in that light, holy frigging cow, he's got nine patients at one time. This guy's like a Superman. He's a hero. Nine patients, he almost made the critical double digits. It's funny, but it's, but it's all we have, ladies and gentlemen. This is what I'm trying to convince you how little I know. Yet, this is amongst the best we have. Looking at what he has, two of his patients got the macrocyclic agent Gadavist. Five got the macrocyclic agent Prohance. One got Multihance, the linear agent, and one got the linear non-neuro agent Eovist that goes to the, the, the liver. And he quantified in their brain, don't tell me about what shows on an image. He quantified how much gadolinium can I measure. The two patients that are on the top of the list in red are Gadavist, they're macrocyclic. The numbers you want to look at are under gadolinium deposition, micrograms per gram of tissue. This is, I mean, any of these columns will show up, but this is a, as good as any to, to show it to you. And look at the numbers for the top two compared to anything else. Now, before I continue, the very, very top patient, the num patient number one, as it's pointing out now, that patient received contrast five days before they died. So this is just my opinion, but I think others share it. 
since it was five days before they died, Manny, that could really skew the data. Maybe that's why it's so unbelievably higher in that patient's tissues, bone, brain, everywhere. Maybe that's why. You're right. So I went in and investigated the second patient. And I, this is not in the publication. I added these words in this label for patient number two. It was 392 days before he died that that was administered, that the last contrast was administered. So don't go tell me about five days. And yet take a look at the levels on that macrocyclic agent. Look at the levels found in that person's globus pallidus and dentate compared to the, the five right below it is a different macrocyclic agent. The two below that are linear agents. It exceeds the linear agents. Go figure. Now remember, we're dealing with a massive N of one or two. But this is what our data is based on. Everything else is theory. Everything else is theory. I can see us taking a square peg and ramming it through this round hole as hard as we can, because you're going to make real life conform to my theory, darn it. And the whole world is doing that. You have no idea how serious I am. The theory of transmutation will explain everything. And if it doesn't, you will find a way to make it work even if it doesn't. Dr. McDonald, a few days ago, came out with this publication in radiology. And in this publication, they took 30 rats, 25 of which survived, and exposed them to, based on surface area normalization for humans, about 80 doses over four weeks. And this is the distribution. Look at the left half now. The distribution of the gadolinium when they measured it. I don't want to see signal on images. Measure the actual animal's brain. Control essentially hovers at zero. Prohan, a macrocyclic agent, not too far from zero. Gadavist, another macrocyclic agent. Well, you'll have to determine whether you think that's hovering near zero. Multihans, another macrocyclic, uh, another linear agent. And Amiscan, another linear agent. Seems to me these guys are closer than these guys. But don't forget, your job is to lump together all the macrocyclics as being the same. And the linears as being the same, and that these have nothing to do with each other. Remember that. But what's really fascinating about this, that's the left side. Look at the right side. The right side is liver, is spleen, is kidneys. Now, did you notice the scale? The same thing is happening at the same relative values elsewhere in the body. And I'll give you a little secret. We see it everywhere. We see it in the heart. We see it in the diaphragm. We see it everywhere. We see it everywhere. Having said that, this is a zero to eight scale for the, what we're seeing in the brain. And the units are micrograms per, per gram of tissue. And on the right is zero to 3,000. So that tells you that there may be differences amongst the macrocyclic agents, even though you will see people like regulatory agencies using the word macrocyclics as if they're all identical. And how about the linears? Aren't they all identical? Well, this was Dr. Romalho. He first published, she first published. There's two Romalhos. They're married. Um, Dr. Romalho first published that looking at the linear agent multi-hands, there was no T1 shortening after multiple doses. But you did have it with Magnavist. Despite the fact that they are both linear ionic agents, they seem to act differently. This is one of the first articles published about this a few years back. And yet, we're still lumping them all together. This is the first versus fifth administration of Omniscan. And you can see the arrows are showing the T1 shortening on the unenhanced follow-up visit. And the seventh multi enhanced visit on this patient, and there's still no T1 shortening on that patient. Now, these are both linear agents, but they don't seem to be behaving the same. Along came Dr. Weberling and said, what are you talking about? Sure, you do see T1 shortening with multiple administrations of multi -hands. And in his publication, he quotes other publications as well. On your right is a Dotoram macrocyclic by Dr. Radbrook. In the middle is a publication about how Magnavist, a linear agent, is acting by Dr. Radbrook, also a co-author on Weberling's paper. And Dr. Weberling on the left is talking about Multihans, a linear agent. But even with their own data, look at the numbers. Look at the measured values for the two linear versus the macrocyclic on your right. The macrocyclic 
the ratio of intensities after contrast was given, 0.05. For Magnavis, the linear, it wasn't 0.05, it was 0.67. And for the other linear, it was 0.1514. That linear agent is closer to the macrocyclic agent. But don't forget your job is to lump the linears together because it's more mellifluous. It just flows more naturally. Dr. Robert works for one of the companies, but I think this is a superb article. In his article, he actually measured um, animals that were then sacrificed. And he found on your left, gadolinium concentration with saline was clearly essentially zero. With a macrocyclic agent, Doterem was here. Linear agent, Multihance. Linear agent, Magnavist. Linear agent, Omniscan. And that's for the brain. If you look in the plasma, none of them had any statistical significance except for one agent, Omniscan. But your job is to lump them all together as being the same. This is an important factor for you to recognize, especially if you're going to talk with your radiologists. So we see T1 shortening in an image. The T1 shortening that you see in an image, which we are all ascribing to gadolinium, perhaps quite appropriately, does not correspond to gadolinium concentration that's measured in tissues. Do you understand what I just said? The gadolinium that you see on an image does not correspond to what we measure on scanning electron microscopy, when we actually can measure this, they're not direct correlations at all. Why? Well, there are different possible forms of the gadolinium. It may be that it's the two of us as we were injected, the initial virgin form. This water-soluble chelated complex may be what we're finding in the tissue, in the brain. We don't know. We don't know the speciation of what's actually being detected in the brain. It may be the two of us. Or it may be that we dissociated and it's gadolinium phosphate. Or it may be that we're together or not together interacting with a massive macromolecule which would have different behavior yet again. We don't know. But one of the interesting things is that from a safety point of view, they may be different if the form is different. So if it's the form that, if the form of what we're finding in the patient is that the two of us are together in the water-soluble form the way you initially injected us. If that's what's in there, if you look at every single autopsy patient ever in the world literature and look at the highest concentration ever detected of gadolinium, the highest, if the form we're in is the two of us together, we can't detect that at 1.5 or 3T. It's below the level of detection. So if the form of gadolinium in the tissue is the two of us as initially injected water-soluble, we shouldn't be able to detect that small of an amount. That's for the highest ever detected and measured in a human. So it doesn't look like that's a likely form of the two of us in that body. What if I dissociated and I found myself precipitated out as a water-insoluble gadolinium phosphate or other such water-insoluble form? Well, if I'm water insoluble, that means water can't get to me. And if water can't get to me, how am I going to make it shine and glow in the dark? I would not shorten its T1. And so that's very likely not the form that we're detecting either. If you stick any gadolinium next to a water molecule, that next to a massive protein molecule, and bind us together, it's the law of conservation of angular momentum. If there's a massive molecule, we're going to start tumbling through space more slowly. And we're not going to get through the physics of it, but the fact is the rate at which the gadolinium tumbles through space is a massive determinant as to how white I will make this meningioma glow in the dark. If you can slow the rate of this molecule's tumbling down, it will glow like crazy. So putting it next to a macromolecule makes it much more efficient, more powerful as a contrast agent. And then, even with very, 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 very tiny amounts, we would be able to detect that. It's called relaxivity. And so it, um, it is actually possible that what we're seeing is that whether it's dissociated or still connected, that we're binding to proteins inside this human. And the reason I bring that up is because you are the neurologist, and your patient is going to be asking you these questions. So I'll ask you now. 
Let's, we got to bring this lecture to a close, so let's start heading there. What if I told you that it's been a long day, I've had trouble getting here, I'm in a bad mood, so I'm going to take this tuberculin syringe out of my pocket. It's filled with gadolinium, and whether you like it or not, I'm going to stick it in your skull and I'm going to inject it in your brain. But since I am, after all, a nice guy, I'm going to give you the option. You get to choose. Do you want me to inject into your brain the initial form that comes out of the contrast agent bottles, water soluble? Would you rather have me inject into you a water insoluble form, such as a gadolinium phosphate, or would you rather have me inject a form that is bound to macromolecules and proteins? This is just a safety question. Assuming that your patient's going to have gadolinium in their brain, if you had your choice, which do you think you'd rather have? Which do you think is most toxic and which do you think is least toxic? And that's kind of fascinating because in 1980, excuse me, 1995 or 96, Vogler published an article which was fascinating. They injected into animals and they looked for effective dose 50 or lethal dose 50. If you inject into the CSF of animals gadolinium, in the form that we now inject into our patients, the actual brand name drugs, stick them into the CSF. You guys keep asking us to do these, right? These cisternographies and stuff, super. So we do them on animals and see what happens. If you inject it into the CSF directly, the macrocyclic agents are more neurotoxic by far. Not less, more neurotoxic. The LD50 is much lower for the three macrocyclic agents in the CSF and the effective dose 50, which means where 50% of the animals show symptoms, seizing and what have you, is lower or much lower for all three of the macrocyclics than for Omniscan or Magnavis, two of the worst offending NSF agents, the two worst we have, the linear agents. So from a safety point of view, this is the article by Vogler. It was in 95, and they showed these are the three macrocyclics, the LD50, 86, 46, 58 for the macrocyclics. For the linears, 208, 740. That's how much you have to introduce before, they get, before half of them die. So we've actually known for a while that the macrocyclics are more neurotoxic in the CSF. Why do we care about the CSF? Didn't it bother any of you? How do you find gadolinium retained in the brain? The whole reason that we use gadolinium is because it doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier. And so if you inject it and something's glowing in the dark, it's a marker for disruption of the blood-brain barrier, just like iodine and CT, right? The heck are you finding this in the brain? So in our illustrious literature and radiology, you will find that there are already articles that publish that say, so we see we were wrong about that too, and clearly it crosses the blood-brain barrier. The next thing I'm going to tell you is just opinion. I just, just happen to be right. No, it doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier. Physics doesn't decide to not work on Thursdays. It's too big to cross an intact blood-brain barrier. We know they're molecular weights. We're not that dumb. It goes there through the glymphatics. It gets you through the CSF. In fact, ladies and gentlemen, every single patient you've ever injected with gadolinium, if you bring them back four hours later, go look at their CSF. It's swimming with the stuff. You just didn't know about it because you had no reason to ask. But I have some patients I think I loaded up to show you from 2003. I was doing some work with this. This is a patient who was supposed to get a CSF cisternogram. They were going to use Magnavis. They put in the article. They were out. They ran out. So they used two cc's intrathecally of gadavist, a macrocyclic agent, instead of a linear agent. Less than five minutes later, the symptoms began. He injected a macrocyclic into the CSF. His conclusion as to why she had such problems, people think that all the gadolinium agents are the same. It's crucial to distinguish between the different agents because of different chemical profiles and side effects. And the use of a, a macrocyclic in the intrathecal space should be used with extreme caution. Yeah, I agree with that. And so we know that in the original form, if you're going to do that, you don't want a macrocyclic in your CSF. If it's dissociated, precipitated out, oh, that would be harmful, right? Guys, how many of your patients have calcification of the basal ganglia? We don't even talk about it in the, in the reports anymore, right? I don't bother saying to you, look at the basal ganglia, they're calcified. Big deal, move on. Nobody knows why. 
Nobody knows why they calcify. We know that calcium is a metal. Remember, gadolinium and calcium, they substitute for each other. So we know that it goes there. It seems to be, listen to the words, biologically inert because it's precipitated out. It's not water soluble. Maybe the water soluble forms we couldn't care less about, maybe. I don't know. It's just a, a possibility and an opinion. The linear ones are most likely the ones that will dissociate and become water insoluble. You remember the linear ones, the bad ones. Just read the literature. And the macromolecules, we haven't a clue. We don't even know which molecules you might be interacting, so we have no idea about their safety. You should be aware that on March 10th of this year, the European Pharmacovigilance Risk Assessment Committee was asked to review these agents, and on March 10th came out with a recommendation, get rid of all linear agents. Remove, withdraw marketing authorizations. Take them off the market. There was a, an appeal requested. In, in Europe, everything is very different. The appeal took place. They came out from that appeal on the, 7th of, on the 11th of this month, which is 10th of this month. No, it was the 11th. Let me get to it. Remove all the linear agents. They had an appeal three or four days ago. They ruled, we're going to maintain what we initially said, but you can use multi hands one of the linears, for liver imaging only, not neuro. And um, it's because of an abundance of caution. In fact, they said that there are skin lesions that can happen if you have residual gadolinium. It's true. It was seen with three patients worldwide, published in 2013. No other patients have ever been published with it. And they received one drug, Omniscan, a linear agent. And NSF, which is associated with linear agents in an unconfounded fashion, predominantly, yes but not multi-hands, a linear agent that has zero cases of NSF. But let's throw all four of them out, because after all, it's linear, like the other linears, plural. And this is the um, recent ruling when they went through the appeal, the 7th of July, excuse me, where they said, OK, fine, so multi-hands can stay, but only for liver imaging. So this is what's out there today. The Food and Drug Administration responded to this. I'm just pointing out that there are no radiologists on the Pharmacovigilance Risk Assessment Committee. There is no one that has any stated interest in diagnostic imaging. They're pharmacists, pharmacological scientists, statisticians, and one dentist. The FDA came out saying, after the, F, the, the Europeans, the FDA came out saying, well, we don't think there's any reason to change our practice. We're still watching this carefully. And the American College of Radiology, in an extremely unusual step, the ACR came out with their statement, which was a forceful opinion. And I've been in radiology for three decades, and I've never seen that before. After extensive review of the PRAC position and voluminous other materials, the ACR Committee on Drugs and Contrast Media disagrees with the PRAC recommendation. Why would they do that? Why would you use such forceful language? And you're, you're a radiologist. I mean, your, your national food is the waffle. Why would you even think of making a forceful statement against the Europeans? It just doesn't make sense. But if you think that's unusual, look at this. Linear agents have significant and well-documented diagnostic utility and, in some instances, more desirable pharmacologic properties or a lower acute reaction risk than macrocyclics. I'll rephrase that. Some of these linear agents may be better than some of the macrocyclic agents. So we do not agree that you should get rid of them all. That's a forceful statement. So I'd like to stop here to make opportunity and time for questions, but I want to summarize. I'm not joking, as you can now see. I hope what I've impressed you with is how little I know. I think I'm in good company, because I believe, objectively speaking, looking at our data, the number of patients, the number of animal studies, the number of publications, ladies and gentlemen, single digits, small numbers here, to put it mildly. The data is contradictory. It's conflicting. On half the neurodrugs, 
There are multiple peer-reviewed articles saying you see this, and multiple peer-reviewed articles directly disagreeing. A few days ago, Schneider published in the American Journal of Neuroradiology the words, quote, um, these, these are in stark disagreement with the findings of Weber. I mean, this is peer-reviewed literature at its best or at its worst. And yet, we have regulatory agencies that are making extremely dogmatic statements. And the most important single statement we didn't even cover today, which is, is it harmful in the first place? Someone said right before we started, and that's how we'll close, Manny, you know, it's possible that we're making a mountain out of a molehill. I'm a wuss by nature. I'm frighteningly conservative. OK, I'm orthodox. But when it comes to medical care, I'm frighteningly conservative. And the truth is, if I could use an agent that I thought would leave less, even though there's no harm that's ever, ever, ever been shown, I would. I don't want heavy metals in my body if I can get away with not doing it. Absolutely. I am a certifiable chicken. But some of these agents have higher relaxivities. I give the same dose of Agent X compared to the same dose of Agent Y, and I make diagnoses I couldn't see with this agent. It's more powerful. I'm not throwing th drugs like that out. Out of an abundance of caution, and this is the key, and then I'm done. Why did the ACR have an allergic reaction? I am not authorized to represent or speak for the ACR. I can only give you my opinion. But I think it's pretty clear. All of us, I think, hope we're raised the same way. Don't ever tell me how to practice medicine. Teach me, advise me, and get the heck out of my way. This is my patient. I'll take care of them as I think is best. A bunch of pharmacologists and pharmacists and people with expertise in pharmacological sciences saying out of an abundance of caution, throw out the drugs that have the highest relaxivities, the greatest diagnostic potential? Why is that caution? Because it seems to a diagnostic radiologist, the possibility of missing a diagnosis in my book is a safety discussion, not efficacy, safety. And if I miss a diagnosis because I threw out and I went to a less sensitive drug, I call that a safety issue in the first place. And since PRAC has zero understanding of these issues, no background, no knowledge in diagnostic imaging or contrast to noise or any of these things that underlies image interpretation and diagnostic sensitivity, I don't think radiologists want them telling us what should and should not be used for my next patient. And that's why I think they came out with such a frighteningly powerful statement, we disagree with the PRAC recommendation. Let us take care of our patients and start trying to force hype and potential concern, and confusing that with fact. There's so much more that we could cover. You are so blessed that I won't. I thank you for your time and attention. I'd be more than happy to take questions if there are any.